Um, bolts used for engine lifting should be at least a quarter inch in diameter. True or false? True. I don't think so. A quarter inch is not big enough. We need a bolt bigger than that. Oh, yeah. Well, I like three eighths or bigger, personally. Uh, front wheel drive vehicles usually have one engine. It also depends on the size of the engine, but I don't want to use a quarter inch bolt or a six millimeter bolt to pick an engine up with. Front wheel drive vehicles usually have one engine mount on each side of the engine. Where are the mounts usually? On, where are the mounts usually on front wheel drive vehicles? It has one in the front and one on the uh, side. Near well, it's got a front and a rear. It's up right there at the where, basically close to where the transaxle or somewhere there is. Like on Toyota Camrys, you've actually got one over there close to the end of the engine where the timing belt is, and in the back, and then you got a third. Usually, you have three, at least three. Yeah. Occasionally, you'll have a mount coming through the timing belt. So would that be true? Yeah. Yeah, uh, that, that particular thing um, is uh, false uh, because of the way. But the, use the shortest possible boom links on the engine hoist to center the end of the boom over the engine. True. That's true. What's wrong if you've got your boom way long and your leg's really short? It's going to tip over. over. So it's just it's simple physics. Engine accessories must be removed before the engine can be removed. No. Not all of them. Some of them, yeah, you know, you can actually pull the off. See, that engine there was designed and built to go in a car on the assembly line. There's, that engine's never been in a car, it's brand new. But it's got, notice it's got a power steering pump, it's got the alternator, all that stuff is in it. I mean, so they could drop it in there, it was all put together. Um, oil rings are more easily removed by holding one end and peeling the ring out of its grooves. And that's the rings we're talking about here, these little oil rings right here, are the, the little bitty ones. Yeah. So you hold one end and peel it out of its groove. The little, this is the ones that look like, a, they're like a squeegee. You know, basically that's how you do that. Oh yeah, the land pulled out of the groove. Um, that's number five and number six. A major advantage of shot blasting is this, the part being cleaned can can actually be strengthened. That's true. That you know, whenever you you know how whenever you uh, uh, hammer something, it sort of makes it harder. You know what I'm saying? That's basically what they're talking about there. Strengthen a little bit just because that that kind of stress. Abrasive cleaning can be used to clean engine blocks or intake manifold as well as cylinder heads. Do not do that because you can't get all of that trash out of those little galleries and everything. I know there's one guy that sandblasted, had a sandblasting cabinet, sandblasted his intake manifold for his Corvette, and he never got all that sand out of that manifold. You just absolutely couldn't get it out of there. I mean, you know how much how sick that makes you, you know? You know, and I actually, they usually use casting sand, you know, to put the manifold together on the ones that are aluminum manifolds. Work now, manifold. Oh, incidentally, you know, shops. Uh, I've heard that some of the shops, some of the real high tech shops, have got 3D printers. Mm -hmm. And so, what you do is you uh, get a hold of the person that I mean the, that you're buying the plans for. So, I need a intake manifold for a 3.8. You know, it's a plastic one. I was on already for a 3.8 Oldsmobile, whatever. And they send you the plans and charge you for the plans, and you start your 3D printer and you make one right there in the shop. But now, they charge you for the plans. Are those uh, plans only limited to one use? I uh, don't know how that would work unless it gets corrupted the second time around. I had never, I haven't done that, and I don't know, you know, it's just, but if some of those shops are doing that, they're actually making their own parts for 3D printer. Like 50 of them parts and just have them laying there. Yep, but that's cool stuff. To remove the uh, two small keepers from the valve stem, a valve spring compressor is used. Really? What about it? Yes. Yes, you've done that, haven't you? Yes, I have. uh, loosen and remove the head bolts in the same order as bolt tightening sequence as given in the vehicle service information. True. Well, that depends on your uh, vehicle. Now, I will tell you that some of your intake manifolds have to be loosened. If you, Some of these aluminum intake manifolds that are on big V, uh, V6 engines and stuff, if you don't follow the detorquing sequence, you may find out that the manifold is warped to the point to where you can't get it off of there. You know, so be careful with that. I mean, be aware of it. If, you're, if your shop manual says, you know, most of the time we just get our impact and go, wah, 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 and they pull it off. But that's not always a good idea on every engine. Some of the really wide V6 engines, you got to loosen it in the right order or you won't get it off there. Positive rotators used on some valves make it less likely to pause the form on the valve seat. That's true. It basically turns the valve as it, you know. So it was not true or false or was it just kind of true? Nine was basically false according to the answer key, so go there. For easier engine removal, first remove what? The hood is a good thing to snatch off of there so that you don't have to uh, have issues with the uh, hood being in your way. Um, furthermore, if it's got those hood springs that are weak and all that kind of thing, you know. And what I hate about a treacherous 
gas hood springs is sometimes they'll get weak enough where you open them up the hood will stay open and stuck for a little bit and then it will fall on your head without warning just all the bam you know had that happen before uh, this one guy was <laughs> working on a car that philip kirkland was talking about and he was under this hood of this little minivan and he was kind of laying under the hood to, to do to reach something and he burned himself on his drop light or something the engine was running and he jerked his elbow back and he knocked the hood prop out and the hood fell on him. <laughs> he was kicking his feet saying, help, help. You know, he couldn't get out of there. And it really, it that looked scary until you went over and found out the guy wasn't hurt. Okay, uh, 13. Uh, what kind of cleaning is used to clean pistons, valves, and connecting rods? That's the, uh, Wait a minute, I fouled up. Number 12. Uh, the blank cleaning process is used for small parts such as valve springs, spring retainers, and valve keepers. And, and that's what, yeah, that's, that's B, it's vibratory. Uh, 13, cleaning, what cleaning is used to clean pistons, valves, and connecting rods? The aqueous. Uh, aqueous? I don't see aqueous Sorry. anywhere. Shine. Did you just look at the very first letter and decide you were going to yeah. go with it or what? Thermal. What is it? Abrasive. Yeah. Abrasive. Abrasive. The following components must be reinstalled in their original position. A, pistons and connecting rods. Yes. B, temperature and pressure sensors. C, lifters, push rods, or rocker arms. Yeah. Did you guys put the push rods back in the same places on that mention out there? Or are they all mixed up? Probably mixed up. Do you think that's a big deal? It's not. But I will tell you the one it is a big deal on. Uh, if you have to put an intake gasket on one of these uh, engines like what's in that white automobile, that little two, I mean, little 3.1 or whatever, those are different lengths. So you make sure that you put them back where they came from. What I mean is there are two different lengths of push rods. And you gotta, if you pull an intake manifold gasket on one of those, because they like to leak and get water in the coolant. You know, if you see water in the oil on one of those little old uh, engines like what's in this Pontiac out here, it's typically an intake gasket that's leaking water in the oil. I mean, you don't have to change out the whole engine for that. Some people get confused. Water in the oil, that's it, the engine shot. Well, usually it'll be the intake gasket on one of those little motors. When you gotta pull it off, you've actually gotta pull the rocker arms and the uh, push rods out to get that intake off of there. You know what I mean? But whenever you pull it off, make sure that they're, they're like a half inch difference between this one and that one, and you gotta put them in there in the right order. So pay attention to that. A lot of guys will take them and put a piece of cardboard, and they'll actually poke holes in the cardboard and stick the push rods in there to put them in the same order. Now, the one that you guys did, not a big deal. You're not gonna have any problem with that. You just pop it together and everything's okay, you know? But I mean, if you're gonna be a, a, one of these guys that does everything according to Hoyle, you're gonna make their, everything goes back in the same hole. 90% uh, of the mechanics I've ever known that did engine work didn't worry about keeping the push rods in order. You know, not that big of a deal usually, unless they're different lengths like that when I was talking about. Um, remove the valve train components before removing the cylinder head on a blank engine. You know Everybody like that? It's actually B, overhead valve engine. Was now you know what we're talking about when we say valve train components, right? You know what we're talking about when we say valve train components? What you talking about? What, what did y'all have to pull before you pull the cylinder heads off that Taurus out there? Yeah. Rocker arms? Yeah. Push rods? That's yeah. valve train components. If I'm pulling the cylinder head off of a Crown Victoria that's got overhead cam, I need to pull valve train components off of that. You know? I do like to pop those little uh, roller lifters out of there. I mean, those roller uh, rocker arms out of these things. Uh, that little 2.7 in the car we flew with a starter, it's got those little uh, roller rocker arms. I like, you know, like pulling out. But anyway, for the most part, you can just pull the heads off. Just like Quincy pulled the head off of that engine he was working on, he didn't have to take any valve, you know, train components off. He just raised the cylinder head off of there. See? Um, now, in some cases, they're going to want you to turn the engine so that all of the pistons are downed, so that you don't have, so that they're all halfway in their travel. That keeps them clear of the valves. But if you've got the pistons all the way up and you're putting a head back on an interference engine, you can actually, when you torque the head, bend valves. You see where I'm going? So if it's, a, if it's an interference engine, pay attention to those instructions. If it says, you know, find top dead center and then turn it, you know, a quarter of a turn. Because uh, what that's going to do is it's going to get the pistons kind of all even and halfway down to their bores. And that's going to keep you from having valve damage. Now, y'all weren't going to have that problem on that one anyway, on the one you got. Why? Well, because your camshaft is still in your block, and it's the timing chain still on it, and when you put those push rods and all back on there, they're basically going down to the lifters that are driven by the camshaft, so you're not going to have any valve damage on that one just automatically. 
But if you've got timing belt and there, anything could be anywhere and it's an interference engine, you can bend valves if you don't, you know, have those pistons down. All right. You guys got matching questions? Yes. How huh, you do or you don't? We yes, do. All right. Uh, what's used to lift an engine out of the engine bay? Engine hey, give that man a cigar. Okay. Rubber or hydraulic insulators between the engine, excuse me, and frame or body of the vehicle. Engine mounts. Hmm? Engine mounts. Engine mounts. Oh, how boring did he sound? Uh, a subframe used in most front wheel drive vehicles that have a transverse mounted engine is called what? Engine cradle. Uh, how many of you know that putting that engine cradle back in there the wrong way can cause the alignment to be out? There's some actual holes you're supposed to look up that are close to the cradle holes, and if you don't line those up, you may have a, your wheel alignment may be fouled up on it. Uh, I guess Moody did that, huh? When he put that one back in. Number 20. What's designed to support the engine and allow it to be rotated? Engine stand. Yeah. Anybody in here using an engine stand right now? Quincy. Quincy, raise your hand. Okay, uh, number 21. Uh, applies liquid solvent and air pressure to clean engine parts and assemblies. What is that? Pressure washer. Everybody like that answer? <laughs> pressure washer. That's my pressure washer in, in, in term, uh, impression. Yeah. All right. Let's see where are we at here. Bingo, <laughs> 22. Um, caused by normal cylinder wall wear due to piston ring travel needs to be removed with a reamer. Ridge. Why does Debbie keep calling me? I'll call her back in just a minute. Take your phone off the um, All right. Number 23 involves the use of machines often called tumblers. Huh? That's a uh, yeah, vibratory cleaning. Uh, also called glass bead blasting. Uh, also called oven cleaning. There you go. Turn in your test. Three missed calls. Eight, nine, seven, six, five, oh, seven. What? Was fourteen? Was D all the J.